All right. Hello, hello. Let's put this here. Welcome. Woo! All right. My name is Alan Sakyan. We are currently at the Loft Center in beautiful Yerevan, Armenia for another talk. This one is going to be on life coaching, entrepreneurship, and trending technology. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thanks for Loft for having me. And thank you for you guys tuning in at home. I appreciate you guys watching as well. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Alan, I'm Armenian. Um, I am currently in Yerevan to visit my family and explore the culture and history of Armenia as well as give some talks and try and inspire entrepreneurship here. So I myself uh, live in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, California. I have started a couple businesses. One of them is a science comedy show, um, trying to communicate science in fun and relatable ways to the world. One of them is a World's Fair Future Festivals. Uh, where 15,000 people come to experience new VR, AR, drones, 3D printers, all new technology, as well as have a big speaker stage that happens every few months. And then uh, working on a new series called The Simulation, and I like mentoring uh, entrepreneurs across the world. So, we are going to get inspired. Woo! All right. Um, let's jump right into the talk. And normally I do some activities beforehand. Um, Let's go ahead and do the activities just to get some excitement going. So the first one's a motivational one. So I'm gonna say one, two, three, and then we're gonna go, yes! Okay, ready? One, two, three, yes! One, two, three, yes! One, two, three, yes! All right, good. And then the other one is more of like a meditative one, a more silent one. It's just to observe our respiration and to all go, oh, Together, will you guys join me real quick? Sure. Ready? One, two, three. Mm -hmm. oh. It feels very good. It always uh, vib sends vibrations and good feelings through my body. So I love the extremes of hyper motivation and hyper meditation, and I think that being able to go from super ego to no ego is a really important thing. All right. Find me online, Alan Sakian, on Facebook and LinkedIn, or email me to keep in touch. Let's jump into the presentation. All right, here's our overview. First is life coaching. So under life coaching, we'll go to find your passion, peak performance training, health and meditation, and polymath and empath. Under entrepreneurship, we'll talk about my 3M model, not make market, and then team and EQ, which is emotional quotient. And the third point is trending technology, so we'll go into AI, robotics, biotech space, energy and global warming, neuroscience, healthcare, and VR, AR education. All right, so without further ado, life coaching. Bum, bum, bum. Do we really need to be coached about life? Not really. I mean, we pretty much enjoy life. It's not much more than that. Breathe, eat food, have sex, reproduce, get to the next planet orbiting a star, right? Right? Right. <laughs> but there are some things that really help us along the way. And some of those things are to find something every single day that lights the fire under your ass. So what can you wake up every single day and love doing so it doesn't even feel like it's work? How do you do that? Well, you gotta dig deep down into you and find out what that essence or theme is. And you gotta try new things so you can figure out what that theme is. What are you passionate about? Do you wanna make the world better? But how do you wanna make the world better? Through what means? What impact do you wanna make in the universe? not just in your community, but outside of your community, around the world, and even further. And then, like I said, constantly trying new things, meetup.com is a great platform to do that. Next point, peak performance training. This is where Tony Robbins and a lot of the motivational, inspirational people come into play, the ones that go, one, two, three, yes, one, two, three, yes, and they get people to, you know, break boards and get super excited, ah! And in order to do that, you, 
and then you sit back down and you like get your work done or you go and you motivate people or whatever it is and in order to feel that way you got to get into a daily routine for example some of the things that I do in my daily routine well before I do that how about you guys let's hear some of your daily routine what do you wake up in the morning and do every day walk my dog walk your dog okay that's a good one it's a routine yes <laughs> Teeth brushing, dog walking, yes, this is very important things. What? A, a cup of coffee, yes. So so these are your routines that you do in the morning. And if you you know don't walk your dog, then your dog will have an accident in your house. If you don't brush your teeth, nobody will talk to you. If you don't uh, drink your cup of coffee, you might not have adequate enough energy. Well, my replacement for my like cup of coffee and that kind of stuff is I do priming. So, and I get going with my day that way. And I also do things like take a quick minute or two to just breathe and stretch my body in the morning, maybe drink some hot tea, maybe do creative journaling. I like to wait a little bit before getting on my phone. Having laser-like focus is extremely important. So being able to focus in on what you want to get done and deprioritize everything else. How to get there. How to get there, yeah. So um, you have a goal in mind. Uh, your goal is to finish something in the next week or in the next month, whatever that goal is. And you know that in order to get it done that you have to focus on it. So rather than spending an extra day of drinking tea and hanging out with friends, maybe that day needs to be spent at home working on your project or by yourself on the cascade or wherever you are working on your project, what you want to get done. And this is the main part is about holding yourself accountable. You, you know that the long term goal of you finishing your project is more important to you than the short term goal of just going and hanging out with friends. It's just a difference in uh, of focus. There's a book called The Distracted Mind. Adam Gazelli wrote it um, and Larry Rosen wrote it. Um, we, we, t we like to go for the short-term dopamine rewards of getting a text, uh, getting distracted to go do things versus the long-term reward, which is to finish your weekly objective. It's just the difference between bottom-up processing and top-down processing in the brain. The more primordial reptilian side of things is like, I want more texting and more emailing because it's quick and easy and more information because we're information gatherers, hunters, versus the top-down processing that then says, no, I'm going to go and finish these goals. Attend epic conferences, learn and network. This is really important. Um, there are so many cool things happening in Armenia with really smart people um, and even further abroad and out of here. Um, go and travel to those places, stay in the city and go to those conferences um, because you will learn and network. And you, what you will find is you might find your co-founders here, you might find people that help make your idea better here. And then this last part, you might actually find coaches and mentors that can help you with your goals as well in a more mentorship role and not a partnership role. Um, and this is really important on both the business side and the spiritual side. So not just people that can help you with the business, but also that can help you with your health and your meditation and your connection to nature and your connection to yourself. Um, and that in turn helps your business. All right, health and meditation. Getting into a body and mind routine in the morning as well. So like I said, drinking some hot tea or doing some jumping jacks or some stretching in the morning, some breathing. Prioritizing your health. If you're sitting down at your computer and working and you're like this all day long, you're gonna feel pain in your back, you're gonna feel pain in your hips. We have to take time to go and start getting our blood flowing in some sort of ways. Every 30 minutes, every 60 minutes, get yourself into a habit of standing up and stretching. Practicing meditation and equanimity. I like to do this, uh, this analogy for equanimity. Um, equanimity is when you're staying mentally even. So rather than going to extremes of negativity or extremes of positivity, we stay pretty mentally even. So when you're driving and someone cuts you off in traffic, you don't get very upset at them uh, because you never know, they could be going to the hospital. Um, when, uh, when your server brings you your food that's cold, you want to gently and politely ask them, hey, my food was cold or it was wrong order um, and not get super duper angry at them. 
So um, I have this little example that I do. I usually do with the $20 US bill, but I have a 10,000 drums um, bill here. So this has nothing to do with like currency or anything. This is more as, a, as an analogy. So please don't be upset that I'm doing this with currency. But the idea is that, you know, who wants this bill? Everyone wants this bill right now. But then when you crumple it up and do this to it, now who wants this bill? <laughs> Some people still do, not everybody. And then when you take it and you push it and you stomp it on the ground, and then you ask who wants it, even less people do. And the idea is that this is us. This is who we are. We are an analogy for this bill. Is that we're going to fail, we're going to stumble, and we're going to fall, but it's up to us to stand back up and to say that, no, I'm just as good as when it was like this, not when it was crumpled up. So it's, it's, this is a completely up to us to not get super duper upset, but rather to uh, stay equanimous along the journey. And this last point's about digital detox and nature therapy. So this means when you go um, to places like Savan or when you go to museums or when you go somewhere, just really try to immerse yourself in the nature, in the museum of the thousands of hundreds of people that have went and built civilization into what it is today instead of being on your phone the entire time. Um, and you'll notice that when you look at trees for long periods of time or artwork for long periods of time, you'll be able to see more in it. You'll maybe see the birds flying or the chipmunks uh, climbing the branches or you'll see another detail in the art because you spent an extra minute or two exploring it rather than just moving on right away. All right, next point, polymath and empath. So these are two of my favorite words. Polymath means wide-ranging learning. Empath means emotional intelligence expert. And why do I use these two words and why are they so important? Well, when you know a lot about a lot of different things, to the presentation, sorry about that. I thought there was a, a button on here for something else. All right, so when you know a lot about a lot of different things, what that helps you with is it helps you make interdisciplinary connections in your mind between different, between different fields in science or in people studies, and that's what empath is, is a study of people um, for somebody, yeah, come on in. Um, for someone to be uh, an emotional intelligence expert, they need to have a growth mindset, they need to be able to perspective take, to have empathy. Um, they, need to, um, they need to be able to feel the emotions of another person. When you're able to do that, it takes a long time for AI to automate your skills. And I think that's one of the most important takeaways from smashing these two skill sets together. You know a lot about a lot of different things and you're good with people, it will take you AI a long time to automate your skills. All right, moving on to entrepreneurship. I have this 3M thing that I came up with, map, make, make, market. First one's mapping. What does mapping mean? It means when you have your idea, you need to do market research because we have an idea and we go look it up and someone's already done it. it happens all the time. So we have to go and make sure we've done adequate amounts of market research before we embark on our journey. And then there's gotta be some sort of high level vision for your idea. You have to be able to excite people about what you care about. And high level vision is also gonna give you a roadmap. So to be resourceful and think outside the box, things like if you want to make an idea in just the Yerevan or do you wanna make it in Europe and the US and Asia as well? So think about what three, technology is gonna be like three years or five years down the line. Try and make ideas that other people have never heard of or thought of. And being a powerful executor, networker, and impactor is tremendously important. Um, obviously to stay focused, to know how to interact with people, and to make impact in the world. The next M is make. I see you're taking notes. Taking notes is very good. What you're doing is you're firing and wiring neurons in your mind, and you're able to then go and teach those to other people, and remember it better, and actually implement it into your life. Really recommend taking notes. On the make side of things, this is mostly about your team and about your product. So this is about finding superstars. So you're the top five people that you surround yourself with. So if you're gonna surround yourself with people that, that aren't starting businesses or that have not started businesses, you're probably not gonna start a business either. 
you want to surround yourself with people that have done those things, that have had successful exits, that kind of stuff, which will help you so much with achieving your goals. You are the average of five people you spend most time with. Exactly. The average of the five people you spend the most time with. The next one is to find business and technical co-founders. So if you're a business person, you want to find somebody in, that's good in technical. If, you want to find, if you're technical, you want to find someone that's good in business. And then you want to give equity over several years with vested cliffs. It's the same thing applies to your engineers and designers, operations people, salespeople. Things like a two-year schedule. Come on in. Bar says. Come on in, take a seat. Um, so the same thing applies to anyone on your team is you want to um, give equity over a period of two years, three years, four years, maybe with monthly cliffs or yearly cliffs. Um, Co-founders typically recommend somewhere between one to 10% equity. Um, uh, other engineers, designers, salespeople, ops people, somewhere between a quarter percent equity to 2% equity. So in the making process, you also really need to have your product or service roadmap and milestones. So with that higher level vision, you're able to think of what are we gonna get done at the one month mark, at the three month mark, at the six month mark, and how are we actually going to get those things done? And then this is really important too. People, uh, when, you, when you start a business, you gotta know what programming languages or what design tools or what operations tools, communications tools you're gonna be using to build that business. You don't want to code in languages that are 20 years old. For example, um, Facebook's uh, React JavaScript is one of the most popular languages right now. And I would really recommend people to be looking more into stuff like that, as well as design tools like Sketch and uh, communications tools like Slack and Trello and stuff like that. So look into that stuff and try and incorporate it into your business. And as you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, change the room. Change the room. You're in the wrong room. Exactly. Um, you want to be surrounding yourself with smarter people than you all the time. And if you are the smartest person in the room, then know how to teach people. And the last step is market. So this is a little um, four-step um, that I have on marketing or on just building rapport with people in general. If you ask people empowering questions like, what are you passionate about? Um, what, what can I do to help you? Where are you from? Etc. And people will say, oh, I'm passionate about education or whatever. And then you'll, and then if you just say, cool, that ends the conversation. Versus if you say, oh, well, why are you passionate about education? Tell me more. You're empathizing with them. You're building a relationship with them. Oxytoso, oxytocin is a hormone secreted from the brain in, in, in times of trust. And so it, most of us feel this when we're first breastfed by our mothers. But if you slowly build trust with somebody because you show care about them, this part will naturally happen. Sales will naturally happen. It doesn't always happen, doesn't need to always happen, but it naturally does. Um, I always tell people to analyze people's budgets and always ask for the high end of things. Uh, don't try and sell yourself short if, if, your comp if the company is saying, oh, we usually pay around um, 10,000 for something like this. Ask for 20 because they're typically a company that can, that can pay you way more than what you can actually um, uh, the, the, you, they can pay you way more. You deserve that because you are a small organization. They are a massive organization. You need it to grow. You need the money to grow. Um, and they can afford to pay you. And to have sales goals and uh, celebrate success, give some discounted clients, get, get your business going. If you have zero logos on your website, that's a problem. If you have three or six logos on your website, at least you've started and gotten somewhere. So that means if those companies might not be able to afford your service, give them to a discounted or free, get feedback from them, et cetera, on your service. And then make sure to have strong customer satisfaction, follow up with your customers and get referrals. Referrals are a main driver of additional sales. And this is also a main driver of additional sales. Engaging website and social media. Can't tell you the amount of times that I've landed on people's social medias and websites where I'm just not engaged. I don't feel like they actually present themselves well. And because of that's a major turnoff. If you can't story tell your idea in 10 seconds to somebody, there's a problem. You have to be able to quickly entice somebody to care about what you care about. And you have to make engaging content online. All right, and last point in entrepreneurship is about team and emotional quotient. 
Um, this is going to be really important as you grow your business delegation and trust to know that even though you might have a 10,000 foot or the meter, let's say 3,000 meter view of your business here, that you have to be able to trust other people to run parts of the business that you that you can't get to, that you need them to take care of. And trust that they're gonna do as well as you do and train them to do as well as you do. To have a learning culture at work is really important. So if you, if you do things like have intercompany talks, that's gonna promote people to learn more about engineering and sales because typically those two departments don't meet and don't hang out enough. But if you get them, the engineers, to care more about the salespeople talking to the end clients, as well as the salespeople learning more about what the engineers are building, then you'll have a better and stronger company. So you can have a Friday talk at noon um, and order salad for people to eat. And then share learning videos like on Skillshare and YouTube. If you go and find a strong video where you're learning something new, then share that with other people within your company and tell them what you learned about it. And lead by example with the work leisure balance. So really figure out how to maximize your success at work and help other people do that. But then when they go home and they hang out with their family or whatever, be empathetic to them wanting to spend time in nature or with their family, that kind of stuff. All right, in the last section on trending technologies, probably one of my favorite sections to talk about ever, because there's so many cool things in trending technology to talk about. Um, one of my favorite ones is AI and robotics. So the service industry and manufacturing industry are now being completely taken over by AI. So um, if you think that do you guys think that somebody that's serving coffee is gonna have a job in the future? Hmm? Somebody that serves coffee, will they have a job in the future? Probably not. The, the answer is no. They probably won't have a job, and the reason why is because it's repetitive work. And we even saw in the automotive industry that people had jobs manufacturing cars, and then robots now manufacture those cars. They don't sleep, they don't have emotions, they don't need to eat food, Th these things don't apply to them. And because of that, they can get things done faster, I mean, employee costs are sometimes as close to a third of a company's overall um, operating budget, so they can cut that with robots and investment over time. Um, it's everything from, like I said, coffee to groceries to, um, you'll get, here's some more stuff. Typically, I went, I went to, I actually had no idea that this was coming, and then boom, it came and it blew my mind. Optical character recognition and natural language processing. So, um, actually those should be in, um, well no, that, that, this is the right order, because what you do is you take in uh, information via, let's say, a uh, digital document, and then it scans the digital document to figure out what each character is, and then it makes words, and it makes numbers and then it processes those words into trees to make sentences and to see um, what it's actually saying about the subject. So this is a big one in accounting, optical character recognition, because people pu punching in numbers still need to sleep and sometimes they make mistakes. Computers make way less mistakes doing that and you can handle your company's profit and loss, you can handle submitting your information to the IRS. With doctors, um, yeah, IBM Watson's now going through and scanning medical papers that are being published and sending doctors notifications for them to in better interacting with their clients. So now, instead of them having to spend five hours on clients and five hours of reading papers, they can spend 10 hours on clients and no time on reading papers and get auto notifications on all of the papers. Plus, there's not enough time to read all of the papers. And with lawyers, smart contracts are a big thing, eliminating third-party intermediaries. And then, even in the music industry, we now have AI entering that. And this is the big question, what skills can you build to delay AI taking over your job? Well, in my opinion, it's being a polymath and an empath, but there's much more than that. You gotta start a business, you have to drive that business home with success. The next se section is biotechnology. Parsing the code of life, the A's, T's, C's, and G's that make up everything that we see uh, around us that is alive. And then, furthermore, 
figuring out how to genetic engineer away diseases, so how you eradicate a disease from somebody, how do you um, potentially add a feature to the human experience, like being able to see an infrared light, or to, um, I don't know, have wings, stuff like that. There's biomimicry. Hello. Barb says. Um, feel free to come take a seat, take some photos, whatever you want to do. Um, and then, Designer babies, this one's really fascinating. So, are you guys excited to tweak the genetics of your child? Yeah, of course. You are? Yeah? <laughs> there was a movie. Genome? Yeah, the genome of your child, yeah. Hello. Barb says, come on in, take a seat. Um, it's, it's really important for engineering away diseases and for, um, it gets a little bit more complicated when you try and do things like it make somebody's metabolism stronger or make their uh, intelligence better because who's gonna be able to afford that down the line um, and what's actually gonna happen after 80 years of doing that um, to somebody. It's a really cool point. This one, uh, clean meat in the post-animal bioeconomy. So can, uh, can we literally grow meat without the use of animals? And will people uh, be able to eat that protein uh, that costs so much less to actually make and we're able to then distribute that around the world for people to eat protein? Um, they call it the post-animal bioeconomy. Um, growing meat from stem cells, very interesting industry and big huge bioreactors, check it out. And the last one is about longitudinal studies, um, bioethics, and health policy. This is really important to me. Um, something along the lines of how can you possibly think that I'm going to genetically edit my child and then expect it, you, you might expect a defect over time. That's just that's how it happens. So you have to see uh, what happens over 80 years and with um, the, what are the ethics of that and how are we going to turn that into global health policy. Um, that's a really important conversation that I love to have with people. All right. The next point, space. Super exciting stuff. Uh, understand the origins of our universe. 13.8 uh, billion years ago, Big Bang. Four and a half billion years ago, Earth forms around the star. And then just six million years ago, humans evolved from primates. And here we are today. Smart monkeys with smartphones orbiting a big, huge gas plasma star. Um, and that's the little Cliff Notes version. There's so much more to understand about the evolution of our universe. And then the International Space Station, something I find super duper fascinating. Um, orbiting the Earth uh, every 90 minutes. And uh, about um, 250 miles up in kilometers, that's what, like 400 kilometers. And then the Hubble telescope, which is maybe around like 600 kilometers up, um, is taking in light from stars and then we're mapping it and figuring out our place here in the cosmos. And then things like rovers on Mars that are analyzing the composition of the soil on Mars, trying to see if there's any bacteria there. Did life come from Mars? Was there life there once? Um, and then satellites like Juno and, and around Jupiter and Cassini around Saturn that are finding water on moons in our solar system. Um, on Europa, uh, and on, uh, around Jupiter, and on Enceladus, and Titan around Saturn. Um, even though the one on Titan is methane, it's not um, water wool. So, it's exciting. And then, this part's cool too, it's like exoplanets dwarf our ego, so every time there's a new discovery made in exoplanets, um, an, uh, which is just a planet orbiting a star, outside of our solar system, that it teaches us that we are not alone. We're not alone here. There's so many more potential um, habitable uh, Earths that have, that have grown some sort of life forms. And then the slow process of sending robots to Mars, colonizing Mars, um, and then sending humans to Mars once there's infrastructure there. And then I, I, this is such a quirky phrase, sustainable interstellar colonization. I just made that up like a couple months ago, SIC. Um, I've been rolling with it hardcore since then. It's colonize the galaxy sustainably. All right, and then the Kardashev scale. Are you guys familiar with the Kardashev scale? 
So um, uh, Nikolai Kardashev, a Soviet um, um, ast astronomer or astronaut, one of two, um, he came up with the Kardashev scale, which is basically that a um, the Earth right now is a, is, is a very low on the scale because to be a level one civilization, you minimally need to be harvesting the power of your star to sustain it. And we're not even harvesting the power of our star system to sustain. We're still harvesting fossil fuels on our planet. So we're at about a 0.7 right now. A uh, Kardashev scale number two is when you harvest all of the power of your star. So that means like putting a big Dyson sphere on it, uh, which is just a bunch of satellites around your star to harvest the energy. Um, and then a, a type three civilization is once you've harvested the power of the stars, of all of the stars in the galaxy. And then simulation theory is something I find very fascinating uh, it, because the universe is so vast and because there's been so much time, are there advanced civilizations that have put together enough computing power to then simulate the one that we live in today? Uh, and that therefore the likelihood that we live in a non-simulated universe is actually very low. All right, space is very fun. You guys excited? Of course. Yeah. All right, let's get a yes on three. One, two, three. Yes! yes! All right, next one, energy and global warming. All right, clean energy as soon as possible. It's tremendously important, goes without being said. Stupid bunch. Okay, uh, harvesting the power of our star. And um, this is really cool. So um, this statistic was actually taught to me by Elon, um, Elon Musk. So. In the, U in the United States, we only need a 100 mile by 100 mile grid of solar panels to power the entire country in Nevada, in the desert there. And so um, if you can imagine, all you need is a 160 kilometer by 160 kilometer solar panel um, parking.